Okay, so hello to everybody. Um, I am Carlo Ghia. Uh, I am the chair of this project of uh, the webinars for uh, the next gen uh, uh, program uh, of the International Insolvency Institute. Um, now we will start the, the webinar on Europe, uh, the first webinar on Europe. Uh, I would like to have an uh, to, to make an introduction of uh, um, President Deborah Grassgreen, who is the president of the, of the International Insolvency Institute, uh, and she will make the opening remarks. So I give the floor to Deborah. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, it's actually morning here in the US, but I know it's the afternoon in Europe. Um, this is really a terrific group of presentations that the Next Gen group of IIII has been putting on. As you have heard everywhere, um, we are all in a really unprecedented place with what's happened with COVID and our economy and so quickly. And it's really important that organizations like IIII and our Next Gen group really step up and become thought leaders in this area. We've, um, I, I said yesterday on the call that one of our members, who is a colleague of uh, Christoph Paulus, has been quoted in the press in the UK as saying that while the healthcare workers are saving people's lives, our industry is gonna save people's livelihoods. And it really could not be truer. So the fact that the Next Gen Group and the IIII has been stepping up, um, being first out there with discussion of um, changes and, and programs that can be put in place and really leading with thought leadership. That's what our organization is all about. So thank you for putting this together. Um, yesterday we had a terrific program on the U.S. I'm sure this is going to be fantastic and I really commend Carlo for organizing it and the rest of the speakers and I'm looking forward for a, to a great program. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from, uh, from Rome. <laughs> And uh, thanks, Deborah. Thank you for uh, for giving us this great, great opportunity, for giving to Next Gens this great opportunity for realizing this webinar project, uh, which has its main object to to analyze the experiences and the impact of COVID-19 uh, on single states uh, and analyze them uh, in uh, in a certain way. Um, uh, with reference to restructuring and insolvency proceedings. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick instructions for the attendees, for, uh, for those uh, who are attend attending to the, to the webinar. Uh, there is a Q and a, there will be a Q and A um, uh, uh, section at the end of the webinar. Uh, so if you want to pose uh, any kind of question, please pose them during the session. And then I will read the, the, the questions at the end of the registered uh, session. So, uh, please, uh, uh, if you want to ask, please use the, uh, the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, during this panel, uh, we will discuss about the initial impact of uh, COVID-19 on single states, focusing on UK, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and we will have a little focus on, uh, on European Union. We will discuss about the current situation, future, what measure will be taken, what, are, what will be the insolvency and restructuring reforms, Will be there any kind of opportunity? Uh, well, in Italy, we used to uh, to quote Latin authors, usually, usually maxims. I would like to try to update this tendency by quoting one of the most contemporary artists and icon of uh, rock and roll, which is much much more contemporary. Uh, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, he, in one of his uh, best songs, Dancing, uh, Dancing in, the, in the Dark, uh, which is quite actual in these times since states are dancing in the darkness of this particular situation, spinning around, uh, he says, you can't start a fire without a spark. Now, COVID-19 uh, has been a tremendous spark in these days. So the question is, uh, which fire will start? Good ones, bad ones, uh, will be there new opportunities? And we will discuss about this with uh, Nathalie Schoons, uh, Senior Associate at Travel Smith, uh, specialized in advising on high-profile complex debt restructuring and insolvency, Domenico Benincasa, who is managing partner at Benincasa Nervi Pellegrini Law Firm, and he's specialized in bankruptcy law, uh, Joachim Hummelen, attorney at Nautatutil, Sorry if I misspoken, uh, misspelled. 
specialized in uh, litigation and arbitration, uh, which fo uh, with a focus on bankruptcy, enforcement, litigation, and complex uh, commercial disputes. And last but not least, uh, he does not need any kind of presentation. We have uh, uh, Christoph Paulus, a professor of insolvency law at uh, Humboldt University. So we get to start uh, our panel, our session, and I give the floor to Natalie going to UK. Thank you, Carlo. Um, Carlo, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I can then uh, share my slides. Thank you, that's great. Right, so um, just to uh, talk about COVID-19 in the UK, if you can all see that slide. Um, this is just a bit of a timeline, really, to give you an idea as to what we've experienced here. Um, the first cases of COVID-19 were confirmed in the UK at the end of January. Um, there were efforts to contain the initial cases, including people arriving from the Wuhan province in China, and then some in relation to confirmed cases of individuals who'd been traveling to Northern Italy. Um, by mid-March, uh, reports were indicating that we were probably about two to three weeks behind Italy in terms of the spread of the virus in the UK, with the number of confirmed cases rising by more than 200 people per day by that point. On the 16th of March, the government urged people to work from home wherever possible and to avoid pubs and restaurants. However, a few days later, following concerns that the recommendations were not being observed by the general public, the government then ordered all non-essential businesses to close until further notice. At the same time, they announced a number of significant relief measures, which I'll talk about in more detail shortly. On the 23rd of March, Prime Minister Boris Johnson imposed a nationwide lockdown. Individuals were instructed to stay home and only to leave their homes for limited reasons, including shopping for necessities, exercising once per day, and traveling for work where absolutely necessary. On the 23rd of March, uh, sorry, the spread of the disease had reached its height sort of so far as what we've seen um, in April. And as of Tuesday of this week, in the end of May, we've had 265,227 confirmed cases and 37,048 coronavirus-related deaths. The impact of the lockdown was, as it was in most countries, to effectively halt cash flow for a huge number of businesses who were fell into the non-essential category until further notice. This included most leisure, retail, hospitality, transport businesses many of which were already struggling. Um, for a vast number of companies, this meant that they were effectively facing cash flow and solvency overnight. And um, for those that were able to continue trading that fell within the essential category, um, there've been uh, a, a lot of issues and operational challenges to face, such as continuity of workforce and being able to work safely and supply chain issues. In terms of the impact on the economy more generally, PwC are currently projecting a reduction in UK GDP by 7 to 13% for 2020. And even taking into account, for example, uh, online shopping for the retail sector, retail sales declined by a record of 18% in April. Um, they expect that industries such as retail, hospitality and transport will shrink by between 15 and 40 percent, depending on how the recovery goes. So that's to give you an idea of sort of where we are right now in the UK. Um, moving on, in terms of what uh, the government relief measures were, were that I referred to earlier, um, they announced a raft of, of relief measures for businesses, which included financial assistance, job protection, tenant protection, temporary insolvency measures. And they also launched a number of permanent reforms to the UK insolvency laws. Um, just to briefly uh, describe um, those, um, those reforms and, and relief measures, the financial assistance um, options included uh, deferring uh, VAT for uh, this current quarter to the end of the, fi the, the financial or the tax year. They also brought in a payment holiday for business rates, um, for uh, rates payable on, on business premises. 
The Bank of England um, announced a, a new scheme where they would buy commercial paper issued by large, generally credit rated companies of up to a billion pounds. Um, for other companies, there are a couple of loan guarantee schemes available, which vary in size depending on the size of the company. Um, these uh, basically work as, as a guarantee given by the government in favour of the bank to um, guarantee a loan made by the bank to an eligible company. And they'll also pay the first year's interest on that loan. There's no cap on the total number of, of loans or the total value of loans that the government will guarantee here. However, there was an initial lack of clarity around eligibility, as well as um, sort of detailed criteria, which meant that actually a lot of um, companies weren't as eligible for these loans as we initially thought they would be. Um, the government also announced grants to small companies, particularly affected by COVID. Uh, there's also a future fund, which is an investment scheme by the British Business Bank, which will, we think will probably be mostly used by startups um, funded by venture capital. In terms of job protection, uh, government very swiftly brought in a new furlough scheme, which was completely new for the UK law. There was no concept of furloughing until sort of late March. Um, the government will make contributions to any companies that furlough their workers um, and will cover up to 80% of their wage costs capped at £2,500 per month. Um, the wage um, costs are, are covered from the 1st of March. However, the funding we saw was actually not received until the end of April. And so there was some cash flow issues for businesses whilst they were waiting for the, um, the reimbursement effectively to come from the government. They also brought in statutory sick pay for, pe for workers who are required to self-isolate due to COVID-19. Um, commercial tenants were also given some relief and the government has effectively prevented landlords from exercising rights of forfeiture of, um, of leases for non-payment of rent until the 30th of June. However, this has only sort of kicked the can down the road in that um, it's only deferred the obligation to pay the rent. It will still be due after that point unless it's extended a little bit further, in which case it will be due at that point. Um, so we expect that this will cause some issues long term for, for tenants. Um, in terms of the sort of direct insolvency and creditor action type um, remedies, the government suspended the use of statutory demands and winding up petitions, which are a, a main way of agitating for payment in the UK. Um, so a creditor will only be able to use these options if they can show that the company's um, failure to pay does, does not relate to COVID-19. Finally, there's also a uh, suspension of the wrongful trading regime, which was similar to uh, the suspension in, in other jurisdictions. However, importantly, all of the other duties of directors of finance, companies in financial distress continue to apply. And so the advice that we're giving boards is actually not that different to what we've, um, we've been giving them previously, which is they still need to act in, in the best interests of creditors at a time when um, they, the company is in financial distress. Moving on, um, where are we now? So um, we've seen some easing of the lockdown measures in the UK. Um, individuals are allowed to go out uh, more often and meet uh, one other person in a public open space. Um, workers who can't work from home are encouraged to go back to work. However, they are discouraged from taking public transport. Um, most non-essential businesses are still closed. So um, whilst there are plans to reopen from the 15th of June, um, there, are, you, you know, there are issues with ways of reopening safely um, and, um, and uh, ways of getting back to normal effectively uh, in this new sort of post-COVID world. Whilst insolvencies are increasing, we've not seen a tidal wave of insolvencies yet. And this is probably for a couple of reasons. Um, most companies have all possible measures to reduce costs as much as possible. Um, the relief uh, offered by the suspension of winding up petitions, the deferral of tax and, 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 and protection for tenants has made a huge effect on, um, on the immediacy of, of cash flow needs for businesses. And there's been minimal distressed M&A activity at the moment, and I think that's largely due to issues with valuations. It's very hard to make decisions at this time of uncertainty, and so we expect that that will come. In terms of what we think will come, um, we are expecting that the relief measures will be withdrawn. Um, we think that uh, 
the um, that will cause issues that have been effectively delayed until now. And so the, the, the new wave of, of insolvencies and restructurings is probably going to happen over the next six to 12 months. Um, and then there are queries about whether the economy has changed sort of generally and, and permanently uh, due to the effects of the lockdown. So people can see that they work from home a lot easier than they previously thought they could. Travel is not as common, whether that's locally, uh, nationally or, or internationally. Unemployment is, will have a big effect on discretionary spend by families and by workers. So that will have an effect on retail, on leisure and, and hospitality. Um, and large events won't come back for quite a while because obviously they are a, a big source of concern when it comes to spreading the virus. Um, talking very quickly, and I'm conscious of the time, um, we've had um, some big new uh, restructuring tools announced as well. Um, in the UK. These were originally going to be, uh, were, they were consulted on in 2018, but it was thought that they were probably a bit too complex to put in place with um, all the challenges that Brexit was presenting at the time. Um, now it seems that the government decided just to push them through. So we have a new standalone moratorium, which is, will be available to the majority of companies if there is a restructuring or a rescue that can be um, that can be uh, achieved if, if the company has a bit of breathing space. It's a debtor in possession type um, moratorium that will uh, give that breathing space. Um, also, uh, we have a new uh, cross-class cram down um, procedure, which is uh, basically a type of scheme of arrangement where a court can actually sanction a scheme, even where certain classes of creditors have voted against it. Um, another important change, which I'll touch on quickly, is um, contracts for the supply of goods and services. We previously didn't have a prohibition on ipso facto clauses, but that will be brought in now um, as, as a way of um, continuing supply to companies that are in a, an insolvency process. So that's a very uh, whistle-stop view of what we've got in the UK at the moment. Um, I hope that was helpful and um, any questions, happy to take them at the end. Okay, Natalie, thank you very much uh, for your synthetic uh, um, uh, um, uh, discussion regarding the, the, the reforms and the, the measures that have been taken in, uh, on, uh, in, in UK. Um, I will pass now uh, the, 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 the floor to uh, Domenico Benincasa. Uh, for the questions, we will... Uh, uh, start at the end of the of the session. Okay, Domenico, you can go. Okay, let me just uh, pull up my personal computer. And, uh, and thanks to Carlo, thanks to everyone for your attention. Just a short summary of what was the COVID pandemic situation in Italy and where are we going right now. Um, let me start with saying that among, along Europe, Italy has been the country most affected for a long time and uh, in advance in comparison with other EU countries. You can see it's on the um, Italy representation. Um, the total number of people hit by the pandemic were about uh, uh, more than 200,000 uh, people. And uh, it started from Codogno, the spread out of the disease, on February 21, but uh, there were um, for sure uh, other cases uh, uh, also in, uh, in advance uh, before that date. Um, sorry, I just have a, uh, okay. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Italian legislature adopted a massive measure, sometimes not so timely, but anyway, a huge number of, uh, of provisions. Uh, the main intervention were represented uh, mostly by Prime Minister uh, Decree, which is the DPCM, uh, as the most important and probably unfamous, but uh, uh, um, it was due to adopt such measure. It was on 9 March when the lockdown was extended to all Italy and only few activities were marching on as a news agent or tobacconist or food, uh, food markets. There were some complaints uh, on these measures since uh, with a prime minister decree, 
could not be so constitutional adequate for the limitation of circulation and other personal freedom. And the other uh, measures were adopted by low degrees, as you can see, a massive number to, uh, to react uh, to the economic and financial measures of uh, containment and, uh, and lockdown. The last one is, uh, was adopted uh, in uh, 13 of May and is the so-called recovery decree with a massive intervention also in terms of pages and the cost is almost equivalent of a uh, two-year economic package for, uh, for Italy. Uh, we are looking for uh, the step three, uh, which represents, uh, especially under freedom of movement, a new change for Italy, since people will probably be able to move around any regions uh, of, of Italy. But uh, um, the, the opening of the freedom of movement doesn't mean at the same time the opening of many businesses. Uh, we calculate that uh, in some specific areas, especially with, uh, in the real estate or tourism and construction sector, there is a, an average of 40 to 60 percent of activities with, which will not, will not be able to, uh, to reopen. Um, so even though the, the health situation is getting better in Italy, as, uh, as you can see, uh, we, have an, uh, we are in an economic uh, urgent. Uh, see, uh, you can see by these slides that, in fact, Italy was hit after a, not a golden time period. Uh, if you can, if you see the low percentage of uh, economic growth uh, comparing with the ones with the other economic countries in uh, uh, in Europe. Um, let me expose rapidly uh, the most important measure. They can be divided in two areas, intervention on economic matters and the intervention in judicial and law matters. Uh, on the first kind of intervention, uh, surely one of the most important is concerning labor law with uh, um, strong measures adopted since the, uh, the beginning, especially with the layoffs earning in derogation. That means that uh, such a measure, which is called in Italy um, uh, Casa Integrazione in deroga, can be used for a larger part of, uh, of employers. Uh, it was uh, recently extended up to 18 weeks by the recovery decree uh, and who also changes the way of assumption uh, introducing a simplifying procedure comparing with the with the original ones we had, which had caused some delays uh, as you may see at the moment more hours have already been requested if you compare with the whole 2019. Other important measures are, rep are represented for uh, in advance for self-employed entrepreneurs and VAT uh, places. Uh, just to mention the most important, uh, we have a bonus of 600 year for low income rates for the month of March, April, and it has been uh, raised for May but introducing also another condition, which is the loss of at least one third of earnings comparing the uh, same time of 2000 and the same months in 2019. Uh, we also have a non-refundable contribution in percentage of registered loss, uh, which as I said, must not be less than one third comparing with uh, 2019. And very important, the liquidity decree introduced a fund, a fund for small and big enterprises to be uh, refunded in uh, several years. In this case, there is a, a, a not entire but partial guarantee of uh, uh, the state and a counter guarantee of the SASHE uh, SPI. Um, there have also been uh, some complaint for the fact that uh, uh, also FCA Italy, so it changes its position into UK and uh, 
uh, Netherlands for taxes reasons, but FCA Italy might use these measures up to 5 billion. So the, according to rumors, the holding may distribute for the same period uh, 5 billion profit for shareholders. But uh, I don't want to uh, deepen in too much this question because uh, uh, probably uh, his uh, Honorable President Panzani in the next webinar probably will talk also about um, this topic. There are also important uh, uh, innovation on, the, on uh, real estate and, uh, and leasing. Uh, in order to mitigate uh, the numerous contractual termination due to lack of liquidity and lockdown, uh, the legislature has uh, introduced a general clause according to which compliance with containment measures by COVID-19 is always assessed for the purpose of excluding the debtor's liability. Uh, but uh, um, it, it doesn't mean that it was introduced a general sort of frustration for all contracts. And actually courts are giving diversify, uh, uh, diversified interpretation of, uh, of, this, uh, of this clause uh, in contract law. Um, uh, there are also, th th those are the most important uh, uh, measures regarding economic uh, uh, and financial measures, together with a general tax law deferral and postponement. And passing shortly to uh, a second kind of intervention on, the, on the procedural and substantive law, um, at the beginning, uh, let me anticipate that company and insolvency uh, law, what we call business crisis law, uh, were adopted in a second step. At first, CARE Italy, the CARE decree, just blocked the activity with suspension of hearing and uh, terms until originally uh, April 15 and then May uh, 11. But uh, right now, there are still uh, slowdowns and courts are moving in a random order with postponement of hearing from five to more than 24 months in the most pathological cases and uh, with some bizarre solution for written notes uh, like the chief of uh, Messina Court says that except for uh, exceptional region, uh, reasons, uh, uh, one, uh, parties can use maximum two pages of 24 lines in thanks to Roman 14. Um, uh, now the, the interesting measures on insolvency law have been adopted uh, by the uh, liquidity decree uh, 23 2020 which I don't want to um, focus too much uh, since as, uh, as anticipated there will be another panel on uh, Italian uh, insolvency law but let me just uh, uh, show you which are the most important and they are also in line with other European. First of all there is the postponement of entry uh, into force of the new code of crisis it was postponed until uh, September 2021, since one of the main and the most important innovation was represented uh, by, uh, by the um, what we call procedure d'alert, and the, the courts were not and are not prepared for this uh, uh, big innovation. We have also temporary deferment of bankruptcy filings or requests until June 30. They also block the request of insolvency uh, uh, provided by the debtor himself. Uh, voluntary cases are not allowed, but there are some, uh, some courts which say that in that case, the request of winding up uh, proceedings can be open on uh, when they come from the uh, from the debtor, as in case of Tribunale of Piacenza. Uh, there has been the extension of terms uh, uh, provided for fulfillment uh, of commitment uh, in uh, restructuring proceedings. Uh, you can see that in this case, Tribunale di Napoli extended such measures also for proceedings related to consumer uh, insolvency law. Um, there is a deferral of uh, the rules of reduction of capital pursuant to, loss, to losses until the end of, of this year. 
but anyway, the um, board of directors uh, must anyway acknowledge the shareholders if so if such losses are occurring at, at the moment. Uh, there is a presumption of going concern for financial statement for the estimation of the value of the assets. And there is a, a derogation of the subordination of shareholders, uh, new, uh, new financing. Um, Domenico, can you, can you uh, talk to us about the perspective and uh, close in a few, in one minute? Yeah, yeah, I was, was, I was just, uh, sorry, I was passing to the conclusion. Uh, okay, by now, what we can say about the Italian legislature is that there is probably too much short term is, there is one decree valid for each month and so on. Um, it should be foreseen whether the system is holding uh, once such measures are elapsing. Uh, by now, uh, we don't know if the investment and the injection of liquidity is enough. enough. It uh, depends also on, uh, on EU decision, uh, economically decision. But we must be ready in advance. Well, there will be the tension, inevitable tension between lender and borrower after such measures are elapsing. And in this case, there will be also a strong involvement of bank and state system. Uh, I, the expertise are saying that in this case, the states and the uh, magistrates should and the courts should not uh, fall into the temptation of uh, involve too much economic decision, but uh, most of all, they should facilitate resolution of conflict. Uh, they are talking about uh, the introduction of a new general uh, soft touch insolvency proceedings in order to simplify and reduce costs and to strengthen the actual uh, creditor debtors agreement mechanism and a change of uh, discharge uh, discipline. But uh, by now, I mean, the, uh, the health situation in Italy is getting better and better, but about economic situation, uh, we need and urge more massive introduction of the insolvency mechanism to facilitate uh, the regulation of this uh, tension in the far future. Uh, thank you very much and sorry if I got more time than I was expecting. Okay, no problem. Uh, thank you from uh, Domenico. Uh, it's, uh, it will be uh, good to speak about banks and involvement, but I think that we may speak about this uh, under an EU perspective uh, with Professor Paulus later on. Now I will pass uh, to the floor to uh, Joachim Hummelen, which will, who will speak about uh, the Netherlands and the situations over there. So Joachim, you can... Yes, thank you. Um... Uh, thank you, Carlo, and thank you also to uh, to Triple I and to NextGen for organizing this uh, this great web webinar series. Um, I don't have slides, uh, so I apologize, but you will just have to to look at me for for a bit. Um, it's much better. It's much better like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first, a little bit uh, about uh, how did the crisis start in the Netherlands and how did we deal with it as a country. Um, in, in the Netherlands, the first uh, infection uh, was uh, detected on uh, the 27th of February of this year. And um, uh, then it, it took about two weeks uh, before uh, really um, there was really a crisis. Uh, and on, then on, uh, it was on March 15 uh, that the government announced an, what we call in the Netherlands an intelligent lockdown. So that means that um, all schools, restaurants, cafes, sports clubs, uh, and coffee shops uh, were closed. Um, that was reversed the next day for, uh, for cafes and coffee shops for, uh, for takeout and delivery, but the rest uh, was, was, was closed. Uh, and uh, everybody um, had to keep a distance of 1.5 meters from other people. Uh, but other than that, there were no restrictions uh, on movements by people, so everybody was still allowed 
uh, to go out uh, and uh, other shops, uh, so also non-essential businesses were still allowed to, uh, uh, to operate. Um, we then reached the uh, peak of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the current um, crisis on the 31st of March, uh, when we had uh, 175 death, uh, death on one day. Uh, and after that, um, uh, since the end of March, the, the number of, um, uh, of deaths and, and, and um, people hospitalized has been uh, steadily decreasing, uh, luckily. Uh, and uh, since uh, the, uh, on the 6th of May, um, the first um, major easings of the measures uh, was announced and uh, cafes, restaurants and schools uh, will reopen uh, as of next week. And we currently have uh, about uh, 5,800 uh, reported uh, deaths in the Netherlands. Uh, just to put that in perspective, that's about uh, 34 per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, that is more than the US, who, has, uh, who have uh, 30, uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, less than uh, the UK with 55, uh, and Belgium, for example, with 81. Um, in terms of, um, of impact on the economy, uh, you see that the, well, well, what I would say the usual sector, so that's travel and uh, leisure and uh, so on, have been uh, hit by COVID. Uh, but I must also mention particularly the, uh, the flower industry, uh, which, was, which is heavily dependent um, upon, um, upon experts, and the, the cultural sector have been uh, especially hit. Um, in terms of uh, numbers, uh, you, we have seen that the G that GDP has decreased by 1.7% uh, over Q1, uh, and that's taking into account uh, growth numbers for January and February, uh, and that is the largest drop since uh, the first quarter of 2009. Uh, the unemployment rate uh, has risen uh, by 0.5% in April, um, and uh, Unemployment benefits uh, have, be, have increased uh, by about 15% over the month. So there have been, uh, as of yet, there have been uh, no massive layoffs yet. And that is uh, partly due to the relief measures that the government has taken. Uh, those measures uh, basically can be divided in financial measures, uh, measures to preserve employment and uh, specific targeted measures for specific businesses and sectors. Uh, if you talk about uh, financial measures, um, there is, a, there is a, the possibility of a temporary uh, tax uh, deferral. Uh, and that means that if you request uh, an extension, um, that, that will be automatically granted for three months with the possibility to, to, to extend that deferral. Uh, there is um, a, a bridge provision uh, for uh, independent contractors to supplement the, uh, the income for, um, for, for people working as independent contractors. Uh, and there are uh, a number of uh, programs for providing loans and government guarantees as to, uh, to outstanding loans. Um, the, the, there, there is one... Um, um, uh, guarantee a regulation for larger businesses. And that provides that uh, loans can be guaranteed or are guaranteed up to 50% uh, by the Dutch government. Uh, and you have um, uh, the SME uh, uh, loan regulation for small and medium sized uh, uh, enterprises um, under which program the government uh, uh, guarantees up to 90% of the um, of the, uh, of the outstanding loans. Um, and um, all uh, major uh, banks uh, in the Netherlands have announced that uh, businesses uh, with a loan of up to 50 million euros uh, get a deferral, a payment deferral, uh, interest deferral of six months um, to give them some, uh, some breathing room. And we have seen that uh, in other areas as well, uh, for example, so, in terms of um, uh, rent reductions and so on, that there are no government measures, but that um, uh, 
uh, that there is a, a collective regulation um, that, is, that, that is announced by the industry itself. Uh, we also have in terms of uh, employment uh, measures, uh, we have the temporary emergency measure uh, that's called bridge to employment. Uh, and that provides that uh, employers that have a revenue decrease uh, due to Corona can ask for, um, uh, for a salary subsidy uh, for up to 90% of the salary of the uh, of the employees so the the government pays up to 90% of the uh, of the salary uh, for a period of up to uh, 3 months um, and it used to be that um, if you got that subsidy that you were not allowed to um, uh, to fire employees but that has been uh, uh, that will be abolished uh, that prohibition as per uh, next week um, and then there are a number of measures for specific sectors um, and uh, that includes, um, for example, the flower sector, uh, which I previously mentioned, but also um, uh, uh, the French fries potato growers. Um, uh, apparently, we have quite a lot of those uh, and they are also specifically compensated. Um, so moving on then to the impact of, uh, of COVID on uh, insolvency law. Uh, so what we see uh, now uh, is that um, there has not been uh, a massive increase in uh, in bankruptcies. Um, we have we have we have seen a little uptick, uh, but um, uh, it, it, it's not a significant increase. Uh, at the same time, uh, there have been uh, no uh, immediate changes in the handling of bankruptcy requests so you're still allowed as a creditor uh, and also as a debtor uh, to file for bankruptcy and the court will uh, handle that uh, bankruptcy application as um, as any other applica application um, although courts uh, did announce that they will um, look especially at um, whether a creditor is not abusing his right to file for bankruptcy in case of uh, in case of a, a bankruptcy request, um, but uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, there has not been any significance, um, or there has not not been any case law yet on um, on that abuse of rights in the context of uh, of COVID. Um, and but obviously we uh, expect uh, that in the next few months the number of uh, of bankruptcies will um, will absolutely increase. Um, and that's that that um, that is one of the things that 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 we expect for the for the for the future. Um, you also see that uh, the first uh, case law is now coming out on um, on on mandatory rent reduction uh, and on um, uh, uh, investors uh, trying to uh, to to walk away from deals that they have closed upon. Um, and finally, uh, we also, the government has um, uh, um, uh, made the uh, already pending uh, uh, restructuring uh, bill um, uh, that provides for the possibility to implement restructuring plans outside of our bankruptcy proceedings uh, a major priority. And um, uh, that bill uh, has been passed uh, by the House of Representatives earlier this week and is expected to be implemented um, by uh, the 1st of July to, uh, to allow debtors to, uh, to reorganize um, uh, more efficiently to prevent uh, unnecessary liquidations. Uh, I think that's all the time uh, I have for now. So um, with that, I would like to hand it back to, uh, to Carlo. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jochen, for this complete uh, analysis of, uh, of the situation, the past, the actual situation, and what's next. Um, it, is, uh, it is really interesting to see how uh, countries are handling the situation in a different way. Uh, in the Netherlands, there is no suspension of uh, proceedings in Italy. Uh, for example, we have, we have suspensions of uh, motions to fi fi filing motions of bankruptcy um, uh, for directly for the entrepreneurs. So it's uh, pretty interesting, and we will discuss about it later. 
Now I give the floor to Professor Paulus, uh, who will talk about, uh, who will focus uh, his discussion on a general overview of uh, EU. Thanks, Professor. Thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to be allowed to talk to you and to uh, be invited to participate in this fantastic program here. And therefore, uh, Carlo, thank you very much. And th uh, thanks very much to IIII in general and to the audience. So I'm speaking just a little bit about uh, Europe, which is, of course, the higher level. And therefore, I'm not going so much into the details of what is happening in the various countries or in Europe. You see the first bullet point there you have measures on the European level. Yesterday we heard from uh, von der Leyen that um, she is preparing of something like 750, uh, 750 billion euros. The ECB is joining, the ESM is preparing, and then you have something like the French-German initiative, which is opposed by a couple of countries, and we will see what's coming out. There is on a global level, uh, I don't remember the exact number, or the exact figure, something like 13 trillion dollars, which are planned to spend in order to recover the economy. So that is something which is dramatic and uh, I would say it's unique. What I want to share with you is a little bit of an outlook, um, which is, well, it could be said it's a worldwide phenomenon, but I, I put it down to a year. I, I call it here the triple jump. Um, what we are confronted with, we heard already from the various countries. That was uh, very interesting for me, and I can, can, I can confirm it for the German situation. We don't have yet the, the big wave that we expected in terms of the real economy going bankrupt. This has to do, of course, with the, with the short-term measures that the duty to file for insolvency or the right to file from the side of the creditors is reduced or somewhat deferred. And therefore, it is still likely that such a wave is about to come in the second part of this year, possibly. So what I call the first jump is the insolvency wave in the real economy. And this is, and that is interesting, and we heard it from the previous speakers, um, that one of the measures to overcome this, this problem of the insolvency wave is that loans are given or that guarantees are given, that deferrals are put in place or that moratoria have been set up. All of this is nice and wonderful, but that is a measure which, help, which helps today. And tomorrow, there will come the time at which you have to fulfill the obligations. The deferral will, at some point in the future, come to an end, and then you have to pay. And these payments are then payments for previous uh, rents, for previous loans or, or what have you. It is something which comes alongside the running costs. And therefore you have a huge chance of creating future in the, for in the future NPLs, non-performing loans. And since we have two Italians here on the panel, they know exactly how dangerous this is. This is a, a kind of, of time bomb. And those who are from other countries know it as well. Um, NPLs are a huge issue all over Europe. And the European Commission has uh, set up in the last two years um, something like three, three uh, legislative measures to overcome the problem of NPLs. We will get new ones by these helping mechanisms. This brings me to the second jump. The second jump is the insolvency threat of the financial industry. Again, it is where you can see it best. Aside from Slovenia, you can see it in, in Italy. There were at least four banks which were heavily threatened by the existence of, of the NPLs, and two almost went bankrupt and they were solved. And thanks to Stefania, we have also a rescue in the case of the 
uh, Siena Bank, uh, Monte de Pasque di Siena. But that is all an issue uh, which is caused by the NPLs. And now comes something, and that brings me to the third jump of the triple jump, that it's common knowledge that the insult, the or the threat of insolvencies of the financial industry, the insolvency of banks, is closely interconnected with the insolvency of states. And for that reason, we have the potential, the increased potential, once again, it's coming up every decade or so, we have the insomnia threat for states. And my proposal, which I recently published here in, in, in Germany and, and again in, in England, is that Europe should uh, at least start to seriously think about better even to establish now a resolvency proceeding, a proceeding which puts the um, the debt restructuring of states into a legal order rather than a political uh, maneuvering. So what is the outlook? This is what I see as a huge danger, as I said, and oh, I, my strong recommendation would be um, politicians, please do something about it. It's really, really serious what's going on here. So the outlook is we need solidarity. And I have written this for all the participants. Um, they know what I'm alluding to, par conditio, not uh, creditorum, but homium, uh, uh, hominum omnium. So we need something. I was just uh, writing about it uh, over the weekend, um, that this uh, present crisis tells us a lot about the fragility or the um, questionability of the principle of the Par Conditio Creditorum, because it, it divides the world into the, credit, the debtor here and the creditors there. It looks just at the, at the creditors. But in this, in this crisis, for the first time, we have something like that it's just an allotment of, of happenstance. If, if you are a creditor or a debtor, you are inflicted in any case. The one who is a creditor is in another relationship, the debtor and so on and so forth, and that is intertwined. It's not a sort of unique by um, personal relationship. It is something which is covering like a net all over the world. And for that reason, uh, my strong recommendation for particularly the, long, the, the, the young um, scholars and the young audience here is um, you should think, start to think about very thoroughly what could be uh, put in place in terms of solidarity. We need it in Europe anyway. We need it dramatically. And in this context, and I think it was Natalie who had alluded to this already, or was it Domenico? I don't remember. Maybe it was also Joachim, um, that we politicians should start to think about which economy do we want to have. I mean, each disaster has a chance in it. And I would say that the chance of the present crisis is that we have, we can restart anew. So it, I would deem it would be a huge mistake to go on um, behaving in the future and for the future, preparing for the future as if nothing had happened. We have now such a disastrous um, cut and such a disastrous lacuna that the start should be uh, going to something new. And that is the climate change, the, the, um, the continuation of, of uh, not continuation, the, the improvement of sustainability and so on and so forth. And that brings me to the, to the end. Um, my recommendation. Um, we need to think more about what I call bad weather insolvency law. I call this bad weather insolvency law um, because we in Germany, we had in the last 20 years, something like three cases in which entire regions were um, flooded. There was such, so much rainfall that entire regions were cut off from the outer world, so to speak. And uh, the German legislator reacted within weeks to change the insolvency law, among others. And this brought me to the idea that there is something what we in insolvency law, um, we take for granted certain parameters, uh, certain conditions 
and we don't even think about it. And that is so extremely interesting to recognize when you start to think about the bad weather as opposed to the good weather, um, that, for instance, we take for granted that there is a market for where we can do the liquidation. Liquidation, after all, is a sales process. And for a sales process, you need a market. What if you don't have a market? And so on and so forth. So that is my strong recommendation, I, and I end at that, that please, 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 next generation, come up with something, with ideas for the bad weather and so on so on. Because be sure, and that is what an elderly person tells you, the next unknown will come. We know that the next unknown is about to come. A, be it a, a, a virus, be it a, a bad weather, be it a financial crisis in, in New York, who knows, whatever comes, we should be prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's extremely interesting what you said. It's, uh, it's very important that we must find solutions um, I think that all the protagonists of the, the economics are interested in uh, trying to find the solutions. We are talking about debtors because they have debts, they had debts and they will have more debts now. But we have also creditors and stakeholders on the other side that must know which is the situation and how they can handle their claims uh, against the debtor that cannot pay. So it will be a necessary, uh, important uh, issue to find solution which can balance uh, in sometimes cram down uh, some, some kind of uh, um, uh, strong, powerful creditors uh, who are, uh, who cannot, uh, who, who can try to decide the sorts of, uh, of uh, liquidation proceedings or restructuring proceedings. Uh, now, in concluding uh, um, this first part, then we will uh, we will have the closing remarks from Ivan Romo, uh, who is the chair of the next gen uh, um, of the International Insolvency Institute, and uh, he, he's uh, the chair also of the project uh, of the webinar uh, together with me. So uh, I pass the floor to I give the floor to Ivan. Thank you to everybody. Then we will pass to the question and answers. Thank you, Carlo. It is always a pleasure to listen to you, Professor. Uh, Natalie, Jochem, Domenico, uh, thank you so much. It was very interesting. As you said, Carlo, it is uh, fascinating to hear how things are being handling in a different way from uh, the different countries. And it, it is the same problem for all of us. On behalf of the Next Gen Program of the International Insolvency Institute, I want to thank you for this great webinar and um, we thank all the participants. Uh, Carlo, thank you so on. Uh, please keep on. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we, we just have the, uh, the, the question and answer. Uh, we had some questions and uh, all the speakers already <laughs> answered privately, uh, but I think it's important also to, to ask uh, some questions publicly. So uh, we had an interesting question uh, for, for UK, so for Natalie, how useful will UK moratorium be in practice given uh, the requirement to pay financial creditors uh, and the broad exclusion from uh, eligibility? So Natalie, can you give us some uh, thoughts regarding this question? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question and one that we are currently grappling with, I think all of us um, in the UK about uh, how useful the uh, moratorium will prove to be. Just to summarise the issues, there are various gateways of eligibility to using the moratorium, including things like previous insolvency proceedings um, and different types of companies are exempted, like insurance companies, banks, etc. That's the first issue. So it, it really depends on the type of company as to whether you can get into the moratorium. The other point is that there are requirements to pay certain debts. And if you're not able to pay certain debts during the moratorium, um, then uh, it's really not you're not really eligible for it. And unfortunately, there's a, a helpful little final limb in the um, 
in, in the legislation which refers to financial services. And that basically includes loans, finance, leases, etc. So any amounts due that become due either before or during the moratorium need to be paid by the company. And if um, so, so really that means your bank needs to be on board. And and financial services also includes includes loans and finance leases and various other financial instruments. So it's broader than you might expect. So um, that is the sort of it, it's not a um, one stop shop kind of quick fix to shove a moratorium in and then worry about what you're going to do next because I think I think the bank's going to have to be involved in those discussions and in, in much the same way as they are for CBAs. Um, so whilst it looks like a great uh, product and, and maybe it will end up being a really helpful restructuring tool, it will we'll have to work through those sorts of issues to see actually how many companies are able to do Thank you. Uh, there is uh, another. There was another question. Let me find it because. Uh, oh yeah, um, uh, this question was uh, interesting. Italy and EU on uh, on one side, and it comes from Franco Marmora, from Italy, I, I suppose. <laughs> uh, and uh, it says he says uh, it's important and essential for Italy, but I think also for other countries to receive recovery funds from EU. Uh, EU. Otherwise, will be the end. Do you agree? Uh, this question, I think maybe Dominic or Professor Paulus or so, who wants to to bump in and uh, just uh, give an, a, a short answer. Uh, it is important. We we need to know that uh, if, as as Professor Paulus was saying, if there are funds, uh, they must be then repaid, uh, and we must think about this. So uh, what? What could be the answer? Domenico? Let me leave the screen to Professor Paulus. Okay. Um, I, I was just, on, I combined it with the answer which I have given to someone else. We need solidarity and, and it is, that's, I'm, I'm serious, I'm really serious that I'm grateful to all of you, you young people that you invited me to join here. It is my, 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 plead to you, or I would beg you, please work on it that we overcome the distrust, which is a matter of centuries. If you, I don't have the time, I, I could go deep into it and about telling you or making you aware of that we Europeans, we have to learn, literally to learn solidarity. We know for 70 years now that we are bound together and that there is something which could be the fundament of solidarity, but we have to fill it with life. And that is extremely hard. And it's easy in, on Sundays when you're speaking, but when we're reacting in a crisis like this, all of a sudden it, it pops up and there pops up something which is centuries old and therefore we all have to work on it and yes now that we have such a, a, a fund it needs to be used for for um keeping europe together that is that would be my plea okay thank you professor paulus now i don't think we have much time because brandy pop up uh, and so we need uh, we need to close so i i need to thank you to everybody to for participating. We had a tremendous time together in preparing this panel. Thank you to the, all the speakers uh, for sharing all the information. Now we will have uh, uh, another panel tomorrow, uh, another well webinar tomorrow on Latin America. Then we will have the focus on another part of Europe uh, uh, involving also Italy. Italians make it sometimes uh, too much. Uh, but uh, we have uh, we have uh, another another session on Europe, and then we will close with the Asia, uh, China, Thailand, and Singapore, which will be very interesting on next Thursday. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar, and thank you to everybody. And bye bye, arrivederci to the other webinars. Goodbye. <laughs>